All right. Well, good evening, everybody. It is seven o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started. My name is Beth. I'm the adult programming librarian here for the Mid-Continent Public Library System. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to this evening's program, Exploring Western Provence with Jean Flynn. We're glad you could join us. And a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, we are going to ask that everyone uh, remain muted so that we get good audio. Um, this evening, if you've got questions, please type them in the chat. I'll be keeping track of them and we will save time at the end to go over them. Uh, we also uh, will be recording this evening's program. Uh, and so I will send out an email with the recording uh, link once it is available on our YouTube channel. Um, I just dropped the link to the survey for tonight's program in the chat. So we hope you'll take a few minutes at the end of the program to fill that out. Let us know how we did. Also, if you have other program types or topics that you're interested in, let us know that as well. Uh, that helps us uh, to continue to offer programs like these and make sure that uh, we're getting programs that folks are interested in. Uh, speaking of upcoming programs, I'm going to share my screen here for a moment and... Uh mention some upcoming programs that we have. So hopefully you are now seeing my screen. And the first program that I want to mention um, is called Vaqueros, The Origins of the American Cowboy. Uh, we're going to be joined by historian Jean Flynn um, on a couple of different dates at some different branches, uh, including tomorrow night at our Parkville location. October 15th is at our Lee Summit location, as well as uh, online. And uh, then on November 6th at our North Oak location. Um, but he'll be talking about the story of the Spanish vaqueros and how their methods of managing and moving um, livestock influenced American settlers and gave rise to the American cowboy. All right, so my screen is not sharing. Let me try that again. I, uh, do I have to unshare, do you think? It should tell me. Are you seeing it now? I, I am not. Okay. Possibly. But, I, but I'm Usually it lets me share. All right. Let's. I'm going to say replace the current share. Oh, there you go. Uh, so that one, if you do want to attend virtually, um, you do need to register to receive the Zoom link and it will ask you when you're registering, whether you're registering for in-person or virtual. Uh, on October 9th at 3.30, this is uh, at our Grandview location as well as on Zoom, uh, we have uh, Taylor Gardner, who is coming to talk about changers to uh, the 2024-2025 Medicare. Um, so we'll look at what original Medicare covers, as well as the differences between Part C, D, and Medicare supplement plans. And then, of course, the uh, changes that they make annually in that program. On October 10th at 7 p.m., uh, Dr. Annette Bohannik, a uh, film historian, will be back and she will be talking about uh, the Latinx uh, in Hollywood and um, 
some of the early stars in the golden age of Hollywood, as well as some of the issues they face uh, within the studio system. And that one is at seven o'clock as well. On October 17th at 6.30, uh, we're gonna be joined by our friends from uh, the University of Missouri Extension. Uh, they'll be talking about gluten-free eating and whether you're doing it for health or for weight loss, um, they'll have practical information um, as well as information uh, about gluten-free products and tips for altering recipes. And finally, on October 24th at 11 a.m. at our Riverside branch and on Zoom, um, Tom Tucker will be back. Um, sharing his travels, uh, exploring Lake Michigan and Lake Superior. Um, so you can uh, see the beautiful beaches, lighthouses and waterfalls that are abound in Minnesota, Wisconsin and Michigan, um, as well as explore different parks and attractions in that armchair travel program. So with that, I'm going to shop, stop sharing my screen and let Gene share his. Um, <clears throat> and while he's doing that, I'll go ahead and introduce him. Gene spent 35 years in sales and marketing positions at major technology firms. After retiring, he taught half-time for seven years at Harper Community College in addition to giving presentations at libraries and senior groups, he volunteers at nonprofit Barrington Career Center and serves on the board of the Institute for Continued Learning at Roosevelt University. He holds a master's from NIU in sociology and an MBA from the University of Chicago. He and his wife, Mary, have been to Europe 17 times in the last 19 years and love to share their travel adventures. So, Gene, go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you, Beth. Can you see the slide on your screen? I can. Okay, wonderful. So, uh, I'm delighted to be returning to your library and, uh, uh, and today to enjoy and share uh, stories about Western Provence. So, this is a, a wonderful area of France. Uh, so let's let's dig in. So first of all, when, when most of us, when we think of France, we think of France as a country, you know, in, with a common culture and common language, and and that's largely true today. However, not that long ago, Provence, where we're going to be talking about, the, uh, as early as as recently as 1900 most of the people did not speak French. Now, French was a second language. They spoke Provençal. And uh, it's almost true up in the Northwest in Brittany, uh, Gaelic was the most common language for the, for the regular people. So if people went off to college, if they were highly educated, they would speak French. But, but the everyday workers, the farm workers in Provence, they didn't speak French. That was, that was really more for the... Uh, more highly educated. So, so and, and culture comes into this as well. So, so we're going to dig behind that phenomena as well. So the, the Western Provence, this map shows Provence, both Eastern and Western. So in the middle, uh, there's the, the middle on the left side, you see Marseille. Uh, that's the, a major city and a major airport. Up right above it, there's Aix in Provence. And then further north, there's Avignon, and there's Arles there on the, the left side. So we'll be talking about all of those, these cities as part of the discussion. So the, the past lives on here in Provence. Um, the Romans were here in force. In fact, the name Provence comes from the fact that this was the first Roman province outside of Italy. So so the, the Romans, when they conquered this area, they said, this is our, our, our new province outside of, the, out, outside of Italy, and they called it Provence. So there's middle uh, from Romans here. There's lots of wonderful ruins from Roman times. There's hilltop defensive towns from the Middle Ages. The papacy in the, for the Roman Catholic Church moved here. Uh, and then until, really up until the 20th century, 
it is largely a separate language and culture from the rest of France. So we'll be digging into all of these issues. So first of all, we uh, this trip goes back to May of 2008. So that uh, like 17 years ago, we flew to Marseille, we picked up a car, uh, then we spent three nights in a town called Roussillon, and then we moved to a town, Vaison de Romaine, and eventually Arles for three nights, and then Carcassonne. And then we flew, we drove back to Marseille and flew home. So, so first of all, this was before smartphones. And, and so what we have here is a, a huge map of, uh, the, and this is not a map of France. This is a map of Western Provence. So there'd be another equally sized map for Eastern Provence. And, and these were wonderful um, maps from Michelin and they would have every street, every, uh, every frontage road. So it really was helpful before the uh, GPSs and smartphones made made these maps pretty irrelevant because now we have so many other options. Um, and and here we have on the right, we have the, uh, the, the we had picked up a stick shift car. It was actually a diesel automobile. And uh, and we, we had trouble getting out of the airport. And we finally got out of the airport and uh, but we, we had trouble getting into reverse. And so we finally pulled into a, a gas station and there were four teenagers, you know, just talking, chatting on the side. And we went up to them with mainly speaking English because we're, we, you know, we, most of us did not speak much French. And we asked them for help on getting the car into reverse. And what they pointed out is that in European cars, to put the car into reverse, you have to lift up a ring that's at the bottom of the, of the gear shift, lift that ring up, and only then can you move it to the left, the, the stick to the left and up to get the car in reverse. And I'm sure they snickered at these lost Americans that we did not know the basics of a stick shift car. So, <clears throat> so the first part we want to talk about is the hill towns of the Luberon. And these are captivating hill towns with beautiful landscape. And, and this was our first home, a town called Rusalan, a population of 1300. And when we were there, it, the town seemed even deserted. We, we wouldn't, we'd be surprised if there were 1300 people. But it, this was a town that had been basically a mining town until a hundred years ago. And what what had occurred? They they have this wonderful mineral there called ochre, and it's a it's a red clay type material, and it was used for paint and other other uh, other industrial components. Well, eventually, this was no longer needed, and so the town the the need to have miners there mining this really went away. So the town was still there, but there. But the miners had all the people had just basically moved away. So here we are. If you look on the left, the 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 ochre material, it's really it's not, you know, it's not mining hundreds of feet down. It's right there at the surface, this red clay oxide material. And if you rub your hand against one of these big rocks or these uh, big it's it's a very soft rock, and you can see, the material even just goes onto your hand. Now it's a very hilly, and and in uh, late April, early May, when we were there, it was deserted. Large, it felt deserted. Now there were people there, but it didn't seem like thirteen hundred people. And friends of ours came in July on a singing group, and the town was packed. So so people, it's it's not only do some people live here; it's the vacation home for for people as well. So we took uh, the, the first day, the first full day after we uh, arrived, we we went to the town of Apt, A-P-T. And, uh, and this was a, this was one of the towns that was the, uh, the, the provincial town capital for a while. And it was a, uh, this was our first experience of the French market. 
And uh, here we are at the market. Uh, you have, uh, look at pigs cooking here. They would have live ducks that you could buy to uh, take home and cook. Uh, and wonderful Provencal uh, soap and uh, tablecloth. And this light yellow is one of the signature colors uh, for the Provencal region. Uh, now we, we stopped into the Cathedral of St. Anne. And, uh, uh, and this was, and what we experienced here became a common phenomenon, well, when we visited towns in France. So here we have in the cathedral and on the side, the names of 250 men, largely men, uh, that died during World War I in this town. So a town of, a town of 10,000 people, uh, 250 people died in World War I. And there, and there were probably another 250 or more that were seriously injured, like losing legs or uh, gassing of their lungs. And so a town of 10,000 people, there were at least 500 people that were dead or seriously injured. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is basically 5% of the population. And you look at the list of names and you'd see six or seven names with the same last name. So these were brothers, fathers and sons, cousins. Uh, it's hard for us to imagine the devastation that France experienced in World War I and in England to the to really to the same extent. You know, with the, the the battles going over the trenches, it was just it was just chaos and death at every every direction. And this had a profound effect on France for, for many years. Uh it, in it you know, it's much, much worse than we have ever experienced, even in our civil war. So uh, we took the the next day was a Sunday, so we took a we took a drive to the Abbey of Notre Dame de Sanac, and uh, we here we have it. Uh, this was what we saw uh, when we were there, and this is an abbey uh, from Cistercian uh, monks that dates back to the 1100s. And it's not at all near a town. There's, a, there's other abbeys that are right in the middle of the town. This, this on purpose was remote because the monks wanted to get back to basics and just to pray and work and uh, uh, a very austere uh, environment. And, the, and they, raised, they, they raised lavender and they also uh, uh, copied, made made honey. So those were products that they sold, and even today they sell. So here is what it looked like when we were there in July. The lavender would be in full bloom. So this is this is a classic photo of the lavender fields uh, that uh, that are spread out throughout uh, throughout uh, the uh, throughout the province. So here is the inside of the chapel. And uh, there were a few nuns there, and there were six or eight monks. And uh, there's no uh, stained glass windows. There's no, uh, you know, uh, portraits or gold. Very, very basic. Uh, now we went on after after the, uh, the church service. Uh, we went on to the town called Gort, and this is up in the hills near uh, in the in the area of Provence. And there's just another picture, just a gorgeous view of this town. And uh, it was largely deserted by the 1960s. And, uh, and then it was discovered by the people in Paris for, the, for their second homes you know, to, to come here on vacation. And, and particularly the richer people in Paris. Uh, if if uh, other people could have gone to that town where we were with that uh, Roussillon with the uh, the former mining town, but these homes would have gone for much more money. Uh, and uh, you could tell that in the ambiance and the artworks that, that we saw. So here I am uh, and uh, with some of the art, you know, art galleries that were there and some of the not very nice restaurants. I should point out that this was my Eddie Bauer sweatshirt, sweater. Uh, so e even at this trip, it was not a new sweater. It might have been five years old, and it still sits in my closet. I mean, so some 
some clothing just refused to die and and this is one so it's 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 stretched out a little more but it's it's still uh, a very a very comfortable sweater so we we next after we left Videl uh, after we left that Rusalan we went to a town that, and this was recommended by Rick Steves Vaison de Rome and it's right on the coast it's right on the Rhone river and uh, and this area is called the Côte de Rome, so the like the the roads of of Rome. And in hindsight, if I was doing this trip now, I probably would have stayed here the whole time or in this town of Arles. We 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 stayed at three different towns in Provence, and in hindsight, you know what we know now, we could have stayed at one and then just gone off to visit. The other areas quite easily. It's, it was very easy to drive in this region, uh, and so we, we 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 enjoyed it the way we did it. But if I did it again, I would do it a little differently. But here we have this wonderful uh, this wonderful region of Provence, and it's actually two different towns. So there's a there's a a, a town that was the Roman town down low, and then up high on this. On this tall cliffs, there's a medieval town, and the, and we'll talk about that in a minute because it, in the medieval world it was very important that you have a good defense. So so the Romans part, and here's a bridge, and this bridge is two over two thousand years old. Julius Caesar crossed this bridge, and there's a statue of Julius Caesar there on the left, and 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 here are some of the Roman ruins. From the town, so you 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 buy a ticket to visit the Roman ruins. Uh, some of the uh, amphitheater that dates back to Roman times, and then on the upper level of the town, there is there is another town that was built for the Middle Ages, because in medieval times uh, there wasn't a Roman army anymore. And there wasn't a, a French army that, to speak of to defend the towns. So, so people had to basically defend themselves. And the best, one of the best ways to do that is to build your town up high where you could have walls and you could more easily defend the town. So this is, this is the medieval town that was the result of that logic. And, uh, and here we see the stonework and the, the walkways there was lots of stones in this region, so they could they could build nice defensive walls and build homes. Now, uh, here here is another uh, uh, market day, and uh, where we could uh, uh, buy things for dinner. Oftentimes, we had lunch uh, where we ate out with a salad or at a, a, a restaurant or dined outdoors, and then in the evening would have wine and French bread and, and cheese, really a lighter meal at the, uh, in the evening. And, and that's how many French people do it as well. Their, their main meal is often in the middle of the day. And the kids, and, and most French companies take a two hour break for their workers to go out and have lunch together or, if, or to go home if, if they so choose. And even the schools serve a very, extensive hot meal for lunch and with the with the goal of teaching the children what's what is good french dining about so even younger kids are they're not eating pizzas they're eating you know they're eating healthy cooked meals right at their school so here uh more see more of the colors of the provencal the yellow wonderful pottery now uh here we stopped at the the wine co-op in the village. In a in a wine co-op is they sell wines mainly from the local vintners. So there may be ten or fifteen vintners within a, a five or ten mile radius, and they make their wines available at the co-op. However, they also have a, a wine that is very inexpensive, uh, and uh, and the local people bring in a one liter bottle of 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 glass bottle, and they walk to the back of this co-op, and 
one of the workers with this, what we, we would think of as a spigot for to fill your gas, your car in, with gas. They pull that and they deliver a, a liter of wonderful wine, a red bland wine for just over one euro. So for, for a buck and a half, or, uh, you have a wonderful uh, wine that could be your table wine for your home that evening or in the next day. So it, it we, and we took advantage of this as well. We we purchased a liter bottle, and we could we could uh, take advantage of this wonderful red blend wine. Uh, the next day, we took a, a we took the advice of Rick Steves, the tr the travel guide, uh, and we uh, took a drove through the wine region, and here Mary and I are waiting. We arrived at the Vintner about one at one p.m. And uh, and there was a sign that says well, welcome to our uh, welcome to our winery, we'll we'll be back uh, to serve you at uh, two p.m. So they, their workers were having a, a, a lunch together and they closed down for that that two hour period. So uh, so here at the in mid late April mid to mid May, the 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 wine the grapes are still in the early stages of of their growth. So. The vines are there, but but the grapes and the leaves, they're still maturing. And by late in the season, in September, October, the wine uh, fields will look like this. And, and our experience has been, uh, you can walk through the wine fields and and to the to the right here, uh, there are there are utility roads. They're not they're not roads for cars, but they're they have you know roads that the farm equipment can can ride on and they have the machinery that rides very high that can uh, drive down and and uh, and investigate and spray the the vines and even harvest the grapes so they, they, there's more and more automation in the process but but the interesting thing is we would walk through the v fields and nobody said oh you can't be here it seems very welcoming as long as they expect you to respect their property and not damage anything, but it, it seemed to be a, a welcome, a welcome situation. Uh, so here we are. Uh, here we stopped at another uh, co-op, and uh, and the, the interesting thing here is the guy sitting in the corner. So when you walk into most French stores, they're not running up to you to say, "How can I help you?" Can I show you our latest product? They they kind of sit back. They're there. If you need help, if you ask for help, they're happy to help you. But but it's a very soft sell. They're not uh, they're not uh, trying to upsell. And in fact, the overall marketing in France. I'll use an example of uh, ice cream. Uh, if you want uh, one scoop of ice cream, it might be two dollars. Two scoops are four dollars. Three scoops are six dollars. Well, you know, in America, you know, you, 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 the first scoop might be two dollars, but then you could get four scoops for two and a half dollars. And we, we, we have this upsell logic, or pay a little more and we'll double the size. The, the French and the Germans, they don't do that. They, their logic said, you, you pay based on the quantity that you order. There's no marketing deal. Uh, to encourage you to upsell. Uh, so, and the actual wine process and ratings in France, it's uh, it's it's quite different than our typical approach to wine. Most Americans, we buy wine based on the grape. So we buy a Merlot, we buy a Chardonnay, uh, and but the French, they they view the wines as much more dependent on. The, the the environment, the soil. And so the Cote Rhone wine is actually a blend of a couple different grapes. But uh, but but they really put a whole lot of emphasis on where was the sun positioned in the field. And there's actually at least three different levels of of clear, uh, classifications for wine. So the first level, it could be a Cote de Rhone wine, which means it came from this region. And the region is very, very specific. It's like a, a series of zip codes 
And if you're two feet beyond the zip code, you cannot call your wine a Cote de Rhone wine. It, it, it has to be in the specific zip code where the grapes came from. The next higher level of quality of the wine, it's called the Cote de Rhone, but it's, it's listed as a villages. You, you can list the name of the village. And then the highest level of rating, and these are, these are government agencies that rate the wine. Uh, the highest level is it's a Cote de Rhone wine it's a villages, and then you name the vintner on the label. So, uh, so the, you know, so, you know, so when you when you go to a wine store, the French look very carefully at the uh, what 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 is the category of the wine, and and they view it's much more than the grape. It's the grapes, the soil, the mineral, the elevation. Everything makes a difference to the wine. Uh, now there's fine dining in Provence. Uh, we we are not. Some people would just have fine dining every single day. We tended to, uh, in a two week trip, we might do fine dining, you know, two or three times, but not not six or seven times. But but there's wonderful dining, and the wonderful cheeses. So uh, and the French they take special care with the uh, the sauces. And, and it was historically because the beef itself wasn't of the same quality as American beef might be choice or prime beef. So, so they take the sauces to really make a difference for the, uh, for the, the overall, the overall uh, effect of the dining. Uh, we, there's a museum, the Lavender Museum. So this was on our way to Avignon and Avignon is uh, this is a city from uh, that goes back to the Middle Ages, and uh, Pope Clement, who was a French pope, sitting in Rome, and uh, so back in the thir early 1300s, Rome was kind of a dirty uh, city. You know, many of the buildings had uh, tumbled. It was crime ridden, and so the French king said to the Pope, who was the the Pope was French. He, he said, "Why don't you move the papacy to Avignon? It's a beautiful city, and we'll help you build uh, build the, the papacy there." So, uh, so the uh, the Pope took him, the king up on that, moved the papacy to Avignon, and uh, in in really and uh, relatively short time, they they built eight or nine major structures for the papacy, including palaces for the cardinals and a major new church. Uh, and today they're all sitting there. They're big, but largely empty buildings. So, so, so we, we walked through some of them, uh, but this, this created a problem. And the problem was when the, the first couple of popes that were there, it, it, it seemed to go okay. But finally by 1370s, so here, 70 years, 67 years later, the the uh, the Pope died and the the Italian cardinals rushed together and voted a new Pope. And and back then, you know, the cardinals, they couldn't travel from, you know, very, very far. The, the, the cardinals in England could probably never even get to Rome in time to vote. So the 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 uh, Italian cardinals voted for an Italian uh, Pope. Uh, the the cardinals over in France near Avignon they voted for a French pope so so here we have two people saying I am the legitimate pope and and what what occurred and this is was called the Great Western Schism each of these popes said to Christendom they said if you if you don't adhere to me I'm going to be you'll be excommunicated so so people in you know in all these countries. They were terrified, you know, because the afterlife, every their whole, you know, their whole life and afterlife was at risk here, and and this went on for uh, oh, thirty plus years. And at one point, there were three people claiming to be pope. So so it took you know, it took thirty more or more years to resolve all of this and put the pope back in Rome. But this created enormous confusion. Uh, in the Christ, uh, Christian churches. So so now we're moving on to Arles, and this was our third home base. 
and uh, and Arles, it's, it's a, uh, it was a, a major Roman town, and you can tell that by the Colosseum that sits there, and uh, the amphitheater, uh, and it's right on the Rhone River on its way to the Mediterranean, and so and and it's a very old town, so it was an uh, important Roman fort. This the Romans built a bridge over the Rhone River, and at this point, the Rhone River is quite wide, and but it became a sleepy town by the 1700s. But uh, so that made the rent very inexpensive and, and painters and artists came here, including Van Gogh in the late 1800s. And he spent 15 months here and created over 200 paintings. So here we have the Colosseum, or the Roman arena. And it's missing the top third of the, uh, of the structure. And in the Middle Ages, there were 200 homes that were crammed into this arena for safety. Again, the where we see the arches, this was bricked in, and and we call them homes, but they were they had to be very very small to fit 200, uh, to, you know, 200 separate rooms probably, uh, in into this arena. So that was all removed eventually, and. And you could ask the question, well, why did a third of this fall apart you could, with the great Roman engineering? And and what what actually occurred, and this happened to the Colosseum in, in Rome, the Roman engineers at the top of the structure, they had a an iron, uh, what looked like a big staple holding the, the bricks together, you know, holding the, the, the stone structures. So... Uh, you know, rather than gluing them together, they had this steel, uh, this iron, uh, holding the, uh, holding the, the stones together. And people took the iron uh, because iron was a valuable commodity. People took those out to make knives or whatever, and so the structure was uh, compromised. So when there was a minor earthquake, it was very likely to fall down. So it's still a very impressive building, even though the top third. Is gone, and here's here's what it looks like from the ground level, and inside. Uh, here's Hotel de Ville. And Hotel de Ville is City Hall, and uh, right next to it, uh, to the left of the hotel of the the, the City Hall, is the the Church of Saint Trophy, and uh, also dating back to the Middle Ages. And and we were there. Uh, then we saw weddings. There were weddings taking place all afternoon. This was a Saturday, and uh, and in France, people can uh, people can go to the church, but the only place you can get married is at City Hall. It's it's a civil event, and so you can you get married at City Hall, and then if you want to go to church, that's fine, and have a blessing and have a a service there. But but the only place that a wedding can take place is at City Hall. And uh, and here we see this family. They were playing uh, drums, and uh, it was a, a, quite a celebration. Uh, here we are walking down. I love the picture on the right. A, a, a cat is to enjoying the afternoon. And uh, we we uh, we dined. We often dine with uh, Italian food. Uh, the beauty of Italian food is anywhere in the world, you pretty much know what you're going to get. Because you know uh, the, the uh, polo is chicken, so you if you can see uh, it, it's it's very clear uh, uh, chicken parmesan. You you know what you're going to get. And one of the nights we had gone to the French restaurant, and Mary, my wife Mary, had studied French, and we were prepared to order. And we looked at the menu; nothing made any sense at all. We had no idea what what it was. So we wound up going down the block to an Italian, this wonderful Italian restaurant. And we wound up eating there uh, to uh, an additional night. So here we have, uh, this is a painting by Van Gogh, and it's called Starry Night Over the Rhone. And uh, uh, it's a, a beautiful painting and one of two paintings with the same name. Here's, here's another uh, Starry Night, and this is painted at St. Remy, where, where Van Gogh eventually lived uh, in in a hospital setting, and this was the hospital where Van Gogh lived, and 
uh, and it was run by nuns, and uh, they recognized his talent, uh, or maybe well, for whatever reason, they they supplied him with art materials and canvas and paint. And uh, on the left is the room he lived in. And in typical French style, we could walk into this room. It wasn't barricaded or blocked. We could, they, they expect people to take care of their historical setting. And, uh, and certainly we wanted to respect that. The picture on the right is, uh, shows Mary looking at a reproduction of a Van Gogh painting and, and, and he painted it right at this spot. So they, they put this here to uh, remind us uh, wh where he did actually created the painting. Now, uh, one of the places we visited as part of this trip was a, a, an aqueduct. It was the Pointe de Garde aqueduct. And this is France's greatest Roman ruin. And, uh, Here's a uh, here's a, a photo of it, and uh, it it's it goes back uh, almost two thousand years. In uh, in twenty five years, it will be two thousand years old. It was part of a thirty mile aqueduct system that had many bridges like this, and this one is one hundred and fifty feet tall. And and for the thirty miles, most of it was underground in cement uh, piping, but. Wherever there is a dip in the land, like a valley, they had to build a bridge so that the water could transverse. I mean, there were no electric pumps that could pump water uphill. So, so they, they had to have the, the aqueduct in a gradual uh, incline. And the incline is amazing. It's one inch every 350 feet. So, and, the, and the Roman engineers achieved this and it could supply up to 9 million gallons of water to a town called Nîmes. And uh, so this is uh, this is the aqueduct, and it, it, it doesn't work, it's not operational anymore. But, uh, and here we see uh, there were, this is an earlier picture, and I, I don't think they allow people up there anymore, but they did when this picture was taken. And the picture on the upper right shows the trough where the water would be flowing. And it was actually covered so that there would be no debris falling into the water to, to the water slot. Now, back in Arles, we we visited an Arles museum, uh, and this was this is a museum founded by a Nobel winner named Frederick Mistal. And back in 1899, he won the Nobel Prize, and he used the money to create a museum. Of that celebrating Provencal life, and and so there's a number of, of uh, reproductions or re displays, and this was one of the displays, and here's another display, and this is showing the the food and the clothing that the people wore, and uh, and uh, as well as the you know there were other displays of the language that they spoke, so uh, he did a wonderful job because he was celebrating the the culture, but that even in 1899 was rapidly disappearing. So by this time, there were trains going back and forth from Paris. So France was rapidly becoming a more unified culture and with the French language becoming the unified language across all of France. So, so, so what uh, Frederick did is he showed us a snapshot of life the life that it was already disappearing and today is largely gone. So uh, we took uh, one of our, our last day in Arles. We wanted to go down to the Mediterranean, which was a, like a 30, less than a 30 mile drive. And, and we were going down to the area called the Cama Rouge. And this is, uh, and, and it's famous for the white horses that live in this region. And when we got to the town, uh, it there were lots of cars, there were lots of people, uh, police directing traffic, and we were wondering what was going on. Well, what it was, what actually was taking place, with, without any, just by pure luck, this was the week and the weekend that the Roman people, Roma people, came and gathered in this town, and uh, and and it, and it's a rich town. 
Uh, and part of the legend of this region is that when, after Jesus died, um, uh, Mary Magdalene and Jesus's mother, they they wanted to escape from, you know, Israel, and they they got into a boat, and they the boat without oars it it wound up taking them here. So this is part of the legend, and it's it's part of the legend in the books that Dale Dale Brown had uh, that uh, in the past. So so and here. Uh, uh, so here we have, and in, in, when Mary Magdalene and the Virgin Mary arrived, Saint Sarah was allegedly there to welcome them, and Saint Sarah was part of the Roman people, Roma people, and what we often would call the Gypsies. So here is the Church of uh, Saint, Saint, Saint Mary Santa Maria's, so uh, Saint Mary Magdalene and Saint Sarah, and so here it is the church. And down below somewhere it says the Church of the Roman People, the Church of the Gypsies. So here we have at uh, the the weekend that we were there, it's two days of festivals, of special festivals, the highlight. And and the horsemen take the the horses out into the Mediterranean and then they come back to shore. And they also take the statues of the Virgin Mary and uh, Saint Sarah. And they bring it from the Mediterranean and they carry it into the church. So here we have, these are the Roman people, Roma people. And it you can see some of them are carrying this with the, on their shoulders. It's quite heavy. These are heavy statues. And and we and as we were waiting here, we were actually in the church, and and the young girls were coming in and they were singing Santa Maria, Santa Sarah. Santa Maria, Santa Sarah. So I took this picture, and the, these young girls, teenage girls, are you know singing with beautiful, repetitive songs. And and here we are inside the church, and here we so so the the legend of of the Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene coming here, you know, it, it's it's not in the Bible. Uh, the church says this is the holy place. You know, they they don't know, they they recognize this as a holy area. But they, there, there's really no, you know, formal proof of this. But here we have the priest, and they're blessing the procession, and blessing the process. And we were sitting here; the church was full of people. And I thought, gee, is this going to be the beginning of a, an hour religious service? So, they, so they brought the statue in. The priest gave a blessing, and then everybody went out to the party. And and uh, here, here. As part of the process, the, the, here the people had lighted candles, and the relics of the bones of Saint Sarah are inside this uh, this this box that you see. So this was a a, a, a part of the religious ser service, but but it was very short. And then we were outside, and and here we have the musicians, and. And it's it's a very it, it's got kind of a reverse logic for these mag magicians musicians. Normally, musicians play, and they hope people give the money uh, in recognition of their of their efforts. But here, the musicians wait until there's a sufficient amount of money donated, then they start to play. So they they don't take their chance on uh, people giving or not giving. They wait until people have. Uh, 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 given a sufficient amount, and and you can see the umbrellas. It was raining at this point, uh, but uh, still people were having a good time. <clears throat> now, we uh, the we're, we took another part of the trip. We left uh, Provence and we went further west to a, a region called Languedoc, Languedoc, Roussillon, and. Uh, and this is the, one of the place that we wanted to visit was Carcassonne. So here we see the picture of the Carcassonne medieval fortress. <clears throat> and this is Europe's ultimate walled fortress. It dates back from the 1200s. Now, by the mid 1800s, uh, uh, part of it, the upper third or the upper fourth had been uh, worn out and crumbled. And so uh, so the French government paid for a, a reconstruction 
of the fortress to what it would have looked like in the 1200s. This is relatively rare in, in Europe. Most, most of the time, uh, the historians and the, uh, the, private, uh, the people that want to preserve the building say, let's leave it even though the top third has fallen, we'll, we'll leave it uh, rather than try to recreate things from a thousand years ago. This, but this was the exception. They, they did a wonderful job. So here we have, now, uh, normally, uh, if we were, if I was running short on time, I'd leave here, end here, but, but we still have at least 10 minutes. So I'm going to talk more about Long and Duck. So Long and Duck, the, the name of this region comes from the fact that they spoke, they did not speak French, the, the, the everyday people. They spoke a, a language called Ak. So Long and Duck stands for language of the duck. And, uh, and this was the main language up until uh, like the 1900. And uh, here we see uh, here we see the, the uh, Carcassonne, the remodeled Carcassonne, the reconstructed Carcassonne. Uh, and you'll as you walk around European uh, historical sites, you don't see a lot of guardrails. You don't see uh, fences protecting people from falling over the side. They really expect people to look after their own safety. And, and, and their attitude is, if we put in these big guardrails or if we put in safety fences, we're really destroying the ambiance of history. So they, 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 they leave it uh, as it existed and say, be careful, look after yourself, look after your children, uh, because you're responsible for your own safety. Uh, here, is, here is the town outside the walls but these, this is a town, there was an, an initial wall, and so this was, had some protection, but if the, uh, if the enemy army came in, th th they could conquer this part, but then there was another whole set of walls, another set, set of line of defenses, and then even a third line of defense. So uh, now, during, uh, during the 1100s, Carcassonne, uh, was kind of a unique city because there were Catholic rulers, but Jews lived here, Catholics, and, and a group of Christians called the Cathars. And they lived peacefully, these three different, three different groups of people, but the Pope had other ideas. He was very unhappy with the Cathars because they were Christians, but they did not believe what, uh, what the Pope said was the correct beliefs. So the Cathars they profess the view that there were two principles, one good and one evil, and that man and the material world is basically evil. So that was part of their, part of their, what the Pope said, this is part of their heresy. So, so the Pope invited the French king to come down and have a crusade to wipe out the Cathars or at least convert, convince them to become fully orthodox to, as, as to the correct what the Pope said was the correct belief. So the French king was more than happy to come down and he sent an army down because he said, you know, it, King said, hey, I'm going to be, I'm going to pick up all this land. I'm going to help the Pope, but it's really going to be more land and power for me. So, so they had a, uh, they had a, a 20 year crusade. Uh, many people died. Uh, they're the, uh, the entire towns were often just wiped out if they were a Cathar town. So our final home base here in, in, in Carcassonne was a little town uh, called uh, Akan Menowar, population 1600. And our, our, the town was actually built around a monastery and our bed and breakfast was actually part of the abbey of the bakery, the bakery of the abbey. So. So it was converted into a bed and breakfast, and there's Mary on the right looking down. Uh, here, we the first night we were there, uh, our bed and breakfast hosts told us, uh, go into the town, there's the next town over, there's a wonderful restaurant. He said the, the, the restaurant near them was closed for, I think it was a Monday night. So, so we were driving to the next town, and we returned and we were lost because we we got into this uh, this building, and so I went up and knocked on the door and I said, 
uh, can you help us? We're looking for the local town. And the woman that answered the door, she turned to her son and said, uh, the son was apparently leaving uh, to go home or to a different place. And so he, she told the son, take these people, let them follow you to the correct road and tell them where to turn to get into the town there with that we wanted to go to. So that was very, very nice. And it was a local vintner. And the next day we came and visited their winery. And, uh, and here is the woman, the woman there told us her life story. And she, she was a young woman from Spain, from Madrid, and went to school in Paris and met this dashing French guy who, whose family owned this property. And so here on the left here is the house they live in. And that's the door that Brown is the door that I knocked on. And the building to the right is the chapel. And back before Napoleon, any rich you know, uh, landowner would have a chapel on their property. And maybe they'd have a priest that lived there, but maybe the priest would come once or twice a month. Uh, but there was a chapel. And uh, so when we were coming the next day for a wine tasting, uh, there's Mary and myself on the left and Jim and Judy Hoffman, our friends. And, uh, and there were three uh, individuals from London that also was at the same wine tasting. And so the 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 lady the, uh, the the mistress of the property she opened up the first bottle of wine on the left and that was an eight euro bottle of wine and we tasted that and then we tasted the fifteen dollar fifteen euro and the twenty five dollar bottle of wine and then we were getting over to the far right and this was a ninety euro bottle of wine so at that time that would be about one hundred and twenty five dollars for that bottle of wine. And her son, who now is the manager, the, the, her husband died, but her son was now managing the property. And he came and whispered to her, her ear. And I think he said, these do not look like 90 euro bottle of wine drinkers. So, so she described that bottle, but did not open it, which, which was fine. Now, so here we are, the wine tasting was in the former chapel. And, uh, so we liked we 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 liked their wine and we wanted to buy three or four bottles, but they would not sell the wine in the chapel. We had to go across the parking lot to another little building where they actually had the wine stored, wine bottles stored, and there that we did the uh, the financial transaction to purchase the wine. Now, it uh, I do, don't know why they wouldn't sell it here, but it could be. You know, part of tradition. You know, you know, this was a former chapel. Tasting wine might be okay, but to do a financial transactions in the former chapel, that, that may have been a little, you know, a little risky. So, uh, but to, for whatever reason, we went, went across and uh, purchased the wine. And eventually, they distributed the wine in the U.S., and we were able to buy some at the uh, at the local uh, local wine shops. So here we are. The next day. We took a walk through the Pyrenees Mountains, and uh, the uh, our bed and breakfast uh, individual said hey, uh, it would be a forty minute walk up through this one trail, uh, but it had rained a lot in the previous week, and so the ground was quite slippery. Uh, it's it's hard to tell on that left, but that's actually a fairly significant incline, and with the muddy ground and the leaves. So we had to be careful walking. And then we, we had to cross this little this little stream to get to uh, our spot. Here we are uh, getting back on the other side. So this same area has canals and people. These were industrial canals from the 1800s, back when America was doing the Erie Canal and other canals. Europe created a canal system to move industrial and agricultural products around. And these canals allowed uh, travel from the Atlantic to the Black Sea through all these interconnecting canals and, and rivers. So with our final stop, we were heading back uh, after two days in this region. And uh, our, our bed and breakfast host encouraged us to drive about a mile and a half outside of the little town to a picnic area. And he said, 
uh, once a year, the town people come, they come and have a religious service here, and then they have a picnic. And he said, many of the town, that's the one time a year they're in church. It's not, in France, you know, actually coming to church is is not that uh, not that common anymore. But here we have we we drove out to here, and uh, one of the sites that we saw uh, we saw a teacher arrive with these uh, with about fourteen kids, and uh, he, they had harnesses. He was doing mountain climbing with them, going up the hills, and uh, and one teacher, you know, no parents. The uh, you know the the kids we see traveling in France in April and May you see lots of school trips and uh, you might see one teacher with 40 kids and maybe a second teacher even if they're getting on the subway in Paris they're expected to behave and to follow directions uh, it's very very interesting to see how well the kids perform and the and the idea is if you expect things of kids, they will often perform that. So, if, but if you have low expectations, you can get chaos in every every turn. So here we are finishing our trip. We were coming back to the U.S. Uh, this was the suitcases we had for both of us, uh, one big backpack and then one relatively large suitcase. Uh, today, taking uh, trains across Europe as we more likely do, we would have much less suit, uh, suitcases. You know, basically a a bag that we could bring into a, a small wheelie uh, suitcase that you might bring onto an airplane. Uh, because if you're taking trains, the suitcases have to be on the on the, the under the seat in front of you. There's no other place to put it. And if it won't fit there, it basically is sitting in your lap during the uh, duration of the train trip. So there we have it, Beth. I think uh, one final note, um, Mary, uh, my beloved, beloved wife, she passed away uh, two years ago and she loved to travel. We were married for uh, 20 years and she always would say, travel to Europe while you can before you have knee problems or other issues and uh, wear good shoes and uh, be ready for adventure. And she certainly was. So there we have it. Uh, so Beth, uh, uh, do we have any questions popping in from our audience? All right. Um, well, the, the first question we saw was about the recording and whether it would be available for later viewing. Um, and it is recorded. Um, we will post it on our MCPL YouTube channel. I will email out the link once it is available. Uh, it usually takes us a couple days to get it up there. Um, and I also did drop the, uh, link to the survey in the chat again. Uh, so if you can take a few moments to fill that out, if you've got questions, feel free to type them in the chat. I'm going to give it a minute because we may have some folks typing. I could make a couple of comments while we're waiting. Um, okay. First of all, the in a place like Provence, we rented a car. Uh, it's very easy to do m the vast majority of what I did by taking local trains, local buses, and maybe hiring a, a tour guide for like the wine tasting uh, on the Côte de Rome. So uh, driving a car is, is straightforward, but some people would hesitate to do that, but you still could enjoy this uh, this area uh, tr on your own. You don't you don't necessarily need to hire a, a bus tour company that you spend uh, uh, you know ten days on the bus with a tour group. Th that option is there, but you can do this uh, much uh, on your own as well with with local tour guides and. Uh, the, the people were quite friendly. Most spoke, we were able to speak English uh, quite nicely. And uh, so th that that process, and it, today it's even even easier because of the GPS it can help us get around and help us uh, find the right spot in the right street. Okay, uh, we do have some questions. Uh, first one, do you need to know French in Provence? Uh, you do not. I mean, what you what you want to know is a couple simple phrases 
like uh, thank you, which is merci, and and part of part of the etiquette, for example, when you come into a store, you say bonjour, which is good day, and then when you're leaving the store, you don't just walk out. But the proper etiquette is to thank them uh, for for being there. So you say bonjour, like good day, you're leaving, or merci, thank you. Uh, so that's part of the etiquette, and but uh, but otherwise uh, the uh, the vast majority of people that you meet, well, if they're under fifty, there's highly likely that they speak English, uh, even a little bit that that can help you you with directions. Okay, uh, how long did it take to plan the trip? So I plan. So I I kind of plan because I've done a lot of trips. I tend to plan six or seven months ahead of time, but uh, some people could take this trip and plan it, you know, three or four weeks ahead of time. So it it all depends on how much you like to plan. I enjoy planning. So and we were with another couple, so I wanted to understand what they wanted to do. Uh, so uh, so there's many many different options. I would encourage you to work at the check out the the travel books at the library. There's there's wonderful books, including uh, travel books by Rick Steves and other travel guides, and that can help you give you lots of good ideas. And sometimes, uh, e even a month before the trip, I will actually buy the book so that I have the very latest information. But even if the travel book is a year or two out of date, it still uh, has a wealth of information. And it's so easy now to call hotels in Europe or to email them if you want to get tickets ahead of time or if you want to reserve uh, reserve a hotel or a bed and breakfast. You can do all of that online, it's in, uh, including getting your rail tickets online. You, it's, it's so much easier than it was 20 years ago. Let's see. Have you ever considered leading a trip to Provence? No, uh, people ask that. I enjoy giving lectures. To, to actually lead a trip, I, I've been on trips with leaders. It's it's a whole lot of work to be leading an actual trip because you know whether you have. I, I'm happy to do it with uh, our our close friends, but we've had another trip with uh, two other couples, and and the wives were wonderful, but the men, the the husbands, were just terrible travelers. So it it's much easier for me to to you give travel advice like this, but but uh, leading a trip, it's a whole level of complexity that I try to avoid. All right. Any last questions here before we wrap up? The one message I would give when we took this trip to, I, I mentioned, uh, the the euro was a dollar sixty to purchase a euro, so so when we had a, and we when we had a bottle of wine at dinner, that was ten euro, so that was sixteen dollars. But now the euro you can buy a euro for a dollar ten, so so a ten dollar bottle of wine in Europe uh, is eleven dollars. So it's it's so it's you know it's almost a bargain to be traveling now compared to two thousand and eight, uh, and 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 the and I encourage people eat understand what the local people eat and how they order food because uh, you can if you eat like the Europeans they they have uh, wonderful types of food in different regions but understand what it what it is that they're eating and uh, if you figure out that if you assume you you like that kind of food if you order what they do and having it with a nice bottle of wine it's 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 very it, it's just a wonderful experience to uh, uh, to experience how Europeans and how the French live all right well I don't see any other questions um Someone said they'd love to hear more travel tales. Uh, Jean will be back uh, in 2025. Um, those programs are not uh, up on our website yet, but keep an eye out. Um, and thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Jean, for another wonderful program. 
and have a great evening, everybody. Thank you, Beth. I'm delighted to be here.